So the letter of James and chapter 4, I want to speak to you today about winning the war within. Winning the war within. And the context in James is, um, it opens up in verse 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? This is the um, effort by James to, to reach into the congregations of those who read him and to deal with the wars in, uh, in the church among Christians. And you could extend that to the wars that happen between Christians in the home or between Christians in the workplace. But this is what the, the, the quarrels and the fights that take place between Christians. And yet, uh, I've titled it Winning the War Within because, as you'll see, uh, James identifies for us um, the source of the struggles that spill out into our wars between us as coming from within. So, with that said, by way of introduction, let me read to you James chapter 4, and I'll read from verses 1 down to verse 10, and we'll get into it. James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have. And so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. It has to be a terrible feeling to realize that if you're on a football team, someone on your team is being paid by the opposition to undermine your efforts. But you don't know who it is. Um, many years ago in Norway, an, a politician, a Norwegian politician, became a byword for treachery. His name was Vidkun Quisling. And he was a strange mixture of a man. He had a, a, a pastor for a father who was a pastor in the Church of Norway. And Quisling was a, had a happy and stable childhood. He was an exceptional child. He wrote corrections in his own maths textbook that ended up being published in the next edition <laughs> And then he became a top military graduate from the military academy and quickly rose through the ranks to become a major in the Norwegian army. Then uh, he took part in a relief effort um, when uh, he, the Armenian genocide took place at the hands of the Ottoman Turks. And in the 1920s, he became something of a national hero for his efforts there because he'd rescued so many Armenians and Ukrainians in that disaster. But that by the 1950s and the 1960s, if you used the word quizzling, um, it was as an insult. You might use his name as a description of someone who was a traitor. During the Intervening years, in the, as the storm clouds of World War II were gathering, you can guess which Norwegian politician who was failed in his own efforts to rise to the top, you can guess which 
Norwegian politician who was desperate for power made his way to Germany and made friends with one Adolf Hitler and in the end invited Hitler to come and invade Norway in order to bring him into power, which is what happened. Uh, Quisling became the Norwegian prime minister, a kind of Norwegian Führer, and um, when that happened, he ruled as the puppet prime minister for the German regime, and the Nazis, with his assistance, carried out their work. 38 to 40,000 Norwegians ended up dying in concentration camps under his leadership. Now, I don't know if you ever get to thinking like this. I sometimes kind of go through this mental game of what if. You know, what, what if someone had, had managed to stop Vidkun Quisling? I mean, what if, what if someone had seen what was happening and, and stood up to him and, and, and really made, made efforts to, to bring this rising spirit of fascism in Norway to an end. I mean, it didn't have to be like that in our own country, about three miles in that direction, down near Shadwell in Cable Street. There was a time when Oswald Mosley led a, a company of black shirts. These were the British Nazis before the war. This, 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 I don't know if you know about this, in our own terrible history, uh, but we weren't all the anti-Nazi people that um, we would like to think. There were people in Britain who wanted Hitler and Nazi philosophy to rule the day in our, poli our political system, and, and Oswald Mosley was uh, at the head of it, and his black shirts decided to march through a Jewish area in the east end of London, and, you know, there was a day when uh, the, the people of the east end rose up and there was a battle in Cable Street, and they stopped the march, and then the march was called off, and eventually the people in the, in, in the powers that be said, we, we've got to stop this, this rising root, this, this, this source of Nazism. We've got to stop it in our country, and we can be grateful, can't we? How, how different history would have been if Oswald Mosley and his black shirts had gained power in Britain in the way that Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party gained power in, in Germany. I mean, what a, what a terrible thought. As it was in Norway with Quisling in power, the Nazis had access to the iron ore of Norway and, and they were able to carry out their war efforts. Um, if that had been stopped, how different things could have been. What's all that got to do with James chapter 4? Well, um, James chapter 4 is talking about peace in churches. You, you heard Adam read to you earlier, James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct. Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But, and now James is going to sting his readers, if you have Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And he's talking about the problems that come in churches because of motives, because of a kind of wisdom that really comes from Satan. And as he gets into talking about that, he talks about the wisdom from above, which is... First pure, verse 17, and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so the context is peace in the church. And in chapter 4, verse 1, he starts off what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you. And then, in this passage, which stretches from chapter 4, verse 1, down to chapter 4, verse 10, um, James is going to identify for us the source of the problems in verse 1, and then the steps from the source to the struggle that we have in, in, verses, in verse 2. And then he identifies the two sides 
that exist in this war and in verses 3 to 5, and then the solution to our, our basic problem in verses 6 to 10. So I'm going to walk you through James's um, solution to the problem that we face with the war that is within us. Look at this verse 1. First of all, the source of our problem, the source of the problem that leads to war among Christians. And as I said earlier, it's the source of the problem is what happens inside us. What causes quarrels, says James. And what causes fights among you? Uh, two words, quarrels and fights. This is The first word is a, 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 a word meaning a war or a, a military campaign. The second word would be a word meaning just simply a battle. So what causes these long and drawn out struggles between Christians? And what causes the spats, the battles that, that spring up from time to time amongst believers, whether in a marriage or a church? Well, is it not this, says James, that your passions are at war within you. So right here at the beginning, we've got the source of our struggle, and the source is a war that is going on within us. And hence the title of today's sermon, Winning the War Within. James is going to teach us how to win the war within, but to get there, we need to first of all identify the source, which we're doing now, and then we're going to look at the, the steps between the source and the struggles that we have, and we'll take it from there. But looking at the source, it's quite scary, isn't it? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. What do you mean by passions? Passions is a, a neutral word in, in Scripture. This is a word that could be used of um, any kind of strong desire, any kind of um, serious longing for something. And that could be something good. Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this supper with you to his disciples who talks about the 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 when when the, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 Jesus spoke about Lazarus longing to eat the crumbs that fell from um, the master's table it, it, it speaks about the prodigal son longing to eat the the pods that he fed to the pigs when he was feeding the pigs. It's just a strong desire, and it can be an evil desire. It can be a desire for something that's wrong, or it can be a desire for something that's right. But right here, it's the source of a struggle. A source because it's a, a war that rages inside of you. Now, I and mean, that's the sense that in the... In the original Greek, what causes fights among you? Is it not this? It's the, the, the fact that your passions are at war inside of you, within you, not between you, but inside of you. So we're talking about the internal struggle that goes on inside us as Christians. Anyone familiar with that? I mean, you, you know what we're talking about here, right? You know we're talking about desires that would cause you to have an internal battle going on because you want something, but what's happening when you really, really want something and for whatever reason, you're not getting it. That's the picture that James paints for us. And in verse 2, you can see the steps that take us from those internal passions that are warring within you to the kind of battle, the fights, and the, uh, the, the, the war that we can engage in between us. And it's, it's a pretty sad story, a sad journey that we can go on. Look at this verse 2. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and do, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, um, I'm just going to restructure that a little bit. If you look at the Greek in the original um, manuscripts. There's no, um, there's no words that are translated here as so. The translators have supplied the words so 
in order to help us make sense of it, but um, I, I think it actually loses something of the, the flow of James's argument, so I'll, I'll restructure it for you as I believe it ought to be. Um, they, they put the words in to kind of get rid of James's rather abrupt style, and I, I don't think that's actually a problem. James is kind of remonstrating with people, and when, he, when you're remonstrating with people, your sentences get shorter. Uh, that's what's happened throughout this section. There's no real problem with the way he puts it, but let me just rephrase it for you to try to help. You desire and do not have, comma. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain, comma. You fight and quarrel. Okay, three steps. The last step is you fight and quarrel. The first step is some, a frustrated desire. And so is the second step. But the first step, here we go. You desire and you do not have. You desire. You long for this. You want it and you don't get it. The second step. You, you murder. You covet. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. Uh, now, I don't think James is talking about literal murder here. When you um, think back, as James does a lot, to the Sermon on the Mount, you remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, if you're angry with your brother, beware. And if you say to your brother, you fool. If you say to your brother, you're worthless. You've, you've murdered him. You're in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus taught that in response to the common understanding in the minds of the Jews that, as he put it, you've heard that it was said, do not murder. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother is in danger and so on. Well, um, this is the murder that I think Jesus, James is referring to here. Very simply, he's talking about Christians who among themselves could be exceptionally angry at another Christian. Why, why, would, why would one Christian become exceedingly angry with another? Well, um, I think you could back up and, and say that step one is, is, comes before step two. You desire and you do not have. You desire and you do not have. You know, if you come into the counseling office downstairs having marital, marital difficulties, inevitably someone's upset, someone's angry with some, someone, and, and, and sinful anger always gets drilled down, in our counseling at least, to, okay, what are, you, what are you getting that you do not want? Or what are you not getting that you do want? What, what is it that you so strongly desire? If you meet an angry person, you're generally meeting someone who wants something very badly that they're not getting. If you meet an angry person, you may be talking to someone who desperately doesn't want something that they are getting, and they're angry that they're getting it. But uh, uh, whichever way around you look at it, you can ask that person, you know, what is it that you really, really want right now that you're not getting? And, and here James steps straight from that to murder. And he says, you, you desire and you do not have. There's frustrated desire. You murder and you covet, and you cannot obtain. The, the next step up from, from, and this is the escalation that takes place in, in, inside of us. This is the, these are the steps that take place where, when, first of all, there's a war inside of us that, that's, that's going on with our passions, our strong desires, but then there, there's an escalation that takes place with these steps in which our desires are are unmet, our desires are frustrated, and so we get angry. When we get angry with people, we, we murder, and, and as James puts it, you murder and you covet. You look at something someone else has that belongs to them, and you desire to have it. You look at something someone else is, and, and you say, well, that should be it should be me, that should be mine, and you're angry, and you, and you, and you covet either your, either your neighbor's goods or your neighbor's um, looks or whatever it is. You, you're coveting, and then 
you still can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You fight and quarrel. So the war within, step by step, leads to the war without. And what's the solution to this? Well, um, very simply, and I'm trying to rush through this because we're going to celebrate the Lord's table, but very simply, you do have to um, recognize that, that, that there are two sides here, and um, James is going to identify them for you, but it stings a little bit as he does so. Verse 3, I'm sorry, the end of verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Now, back up for a moment. The, the root of our warring is frustrated desires, strong desires that are are warring inside you, but you're not getting what you want for whatever reason. Now, James nails it. You do not have because you do not ask. You remember Jesus saying, ask and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down. If you ask anything in my name, it will be done for you, says Jesus. And, and, and you say, well, as James said, every good gift and every perfect gift is coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You know, God is not this capricious, mean-spirited, heavenly Father who just doesn't want to give you what you ask for. If you ask for something and it's a good thing, well, then you could say your heavenly Father wants to give good gifts to his children. That's actually the words of Jesus, isn't it? aren't they? Uh, and, and so you say, well, well why, why wouldn't I be getting what I want here? What's, what's wrong in my life? I really, really want this, but I'm not getting it, and I'm getting angry, and I'm getting frustrated, and there's this war that's spilling over from inside of me to outside of me, What's going on? James says you, don't, you, you, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. You, you do not have because you do not ask, but then you do ask and you don't receive because you ask, if you could translate it this way, the, the word would be evilly. You, you're asking for something that's wrong. You're asking for wrong motives. You're asking for the wrong thing, and so you, you, you don't have it. You ask to spend it on your passions, says James. You're just looking for this so that you can indulge yourself. Now, does that help you to drill down to the source of your struggle? Well, James is going to help you drill down a little bit further. He says in verse 4, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to make, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, um, this is kind of scary, but there are only two sides, and James spells out for you here the reality that when you're coveting, when, you're, when your inner desires are set upon something and you're getting angry because you're not getting it and there's this war going on which is escalating, it's because in your heart of hearts you are committing spiritual adultery. And we have to see that. There's, there's, there's no third side. Either the things which you are setting your heart upon are good and godly and God-honoring. Either they are things for God, for His sake, for His glory, for His kingdom, for His benefit, things that you can ask for in his name, things that you can pray for 
gladly expecting and trusting that he will give you as long as they are actually the right thing for you, or those things that you are setting your heart upon are actually things that you should not even be asking for because you're asking evilly, either for evil motives or it is something evil. Either for, for purposes that, that so that, as James puts it, so that you can spend it upon your passions, upon your lusts. It's just selfish. It's just something that you've got in your mind that you just want to indulge yourself in or it's for some other evil purpose. But, but either way, when you fix your heart on something like that, you're fixing your heart upon something that God would forbid you to have. And so James calls those people adulteresses. You adulteresses, he says. Why? Because, well, God's people are supposed to be promised to God in a, in, as as you could say, the bride of Christ. And so when the bride of Christ, when a person from within the bride of Christ fixes his or her heart on something which is part of the satanic world system and you, you're, you're set on it and you want it and you must have it and you won't be happy until you do get it, when, when you're engaging in that kind of strong desire and getting angry with people when they get in your way, you're engaging in spiritual adultery. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. He who is not with me is against me. So which side, you could say, um, am I on when I'm getting angry because I'm not getting what I want? Well, in verse 5, um, James is going to drill that down a little further. It's, there's another translational issue here. Let me just try to explain this to you very briefly. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Um, th that gives us a problem. Let, can I take you through a translational problem at 4.30 in the afternoon? Um, okay. Um, th this is an interpretive struggle does does um the scripture say quote he yearns jealously over jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us question mark end quote well actually that can be found nowhere in scripture and so so some people would say well maybe it's a summary of the things that scripture teach okay but then there's still a problem because um it's got god as the one who's yearning jealousy, or as the AV puts it, lusteth to envy. <laughs> so, hang on a minute, can we really have God lusting to envy? You know, that doesn't, doesn't fit so well. Let me remind you, if you had forgotten, that in the original Greek manuscripts there were no question marks, uh, and there were no quotation marks. Um, it's also possible, um, just as I might ask you, um, are, are we nearly there? Is it time to finish? That's two questions, one straight after another. Um, I, I, it's also possible that two questions follow each other and, and are then followed by an answer here in James, and that's not uncommon. I think actually that's the case, and that's the best way to interpret this. So let me rephrase it for you. Let me just give you that to you. Um, or do you suppose that the scripture speaks to no purpose, question mark? That's, that's a question. Does, does, does the scripture speak to no purpose? Well, the answer, of course, is no. Um, and does the spirit that he's made to dwell in us lust to envy, question mark, is the second question. The answer to that, of course, is no. Does the scripture speak to no purpose? No. Does does the spirit that he's made to dwell in us lust to envy? No. And that fits with the flow of what James is now arguing because he's saying, brothers, sisters, the strong desires that you have in you, that war within you, these strong desires that well up and, and make you angry when they're not being fulfilled, those strong desires don't come from the Holy Spirit, do they? 
No. This, the Holy Spirit isn't making you lust to envy. That's not from God. Well, if it's not from God, where does it come from? Where do those desires, those fleshly, strong desires that you have to have or you'll get angry, where do they come from? Interesting, isn't it? James's response to all of this in verse 6 as he introduces the solution. I said this is about winning the war within. Here comes, here comes the answer. And he starts with, but he gives more grace. Do you, ever, do you ever feel like you're losing the war within? That those passions, those lusts that are there in you that well up and cause you to get angry when you're not having them fulfilled? That you can't you can't overcome it. No, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What is the root problem when you must have what you want? What is the root problem behind that? What is the, the deepest the deepest, most intractable sin in the human heart? It's pride, isn't it? It's saying it has to be about me, that I must have what I most dearly want. I must have it. And so you, you've got this situation that James has described. You desire it and you do not have. You murder, you're angry, you covet and you covet and you cannot obtain so, so you fight and quarrel. Why, why, do, why do husbands and wives fight and quarrel at home? Because they're not getting what they want. Two people not getting what they want. That's a disaster. And now you've got a church full of people not getting what they want. That's, that's like a powder keg. Unless we humble ourselves. Unless we, we kill the pride that says, I have to have what I want. Right? I mean, this is the solution, isn't it? Starts in verse 6. Um, but really, from verse 7 to verse 10, it's kind of like Ten Commandments for humbling yourself. Here you go. Number one, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Well, this, is so, this is so different, isn't it? This is, this is, this is saying, I, I want it. But if God doesn't want me to have it, I'm going to submit to him. I'm going to submit myself to him, my desires to him. I'm going to place myself underneath God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, there's good news after this morning's message, isn't there? Resist the devil. The devil is going to be there saying, you, you want it? This is, this is something God is withholding from you. Stretch out your hand and take and eat, says the devil to you about whatever your desire is. And, and, and so you're going to fight this war? You're going to win this war? Resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. You, you, what do you need in this fight with the devil and all those powers that are described for us in Ephesians 6. What do you need? You need to be strengthened by God, don't you? You need, you need to be strong in the Lord, to be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of His might. And, and where are you going to get that? Well, you draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What's the problem with us when we're weak spiritually well well hold on a minute what, what's the source of our spiritual power answer that question and you know what the problem is when you're weak spiritually your spiritual power it, it comes from god doesn't it it's 
This is the fruit of the Spirit. This is being, when you're full of the Spirit, when you're filled with the Spirit, you, you are full of boldness and, and overflowing with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. There's power for you. Power over your own passion. Self-control. Well, but if, you, if you've grieved the Lord... What happens to it if, if you've sinned and you've grieved the Lord and you haven't repented? You're not, you're not cleansing your hands. You're not, you're not coming to the Lord and confessing your sin. You're not purifying your hearts. You're, you're double-minded. You've, got, a, you've, you, you've got, got back into thinking, I want, I, I, want, I want Christianity, yes, I want Christ, but I, I want the world too that doesn't work. James is calling you to single-mindedness. And, and you can't have the fruit of the Spirit in your life whilst you're holding on to some sin and you won't let, let go of it because you grieve the Spirit, you quench the Spirit. And so James calls us to basic repentance. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. What's he saying? He's saying what he sums up in verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will exalt you. If you're going to win the war within, you have to kill your pride. If you're going to win the war within, you have to... Humble yourself before the Lord, which means letting go of those evil desires, which means even being willing to let go of desires that are otherwise good. There are so many desires that we can fix our hearts on, which are not wrong in themselves, food, clothing, a good name, sexual pleasure, good things that God gives as gifts to his good, to his, I was about to say to his good children. He gives his gifts to his children. Um, and he gives his gifts to men and women to, to be blessed by it and enjoy marriage, family, companionship, friendship, health. Not wrong to want those things, is it? But, but if you ask amiss, if you ask wrongly, evilly, that you might spend it on your lusts, um, well, well then, then you're committing spiritual adultery, aren't you? Then what, 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 what was a good desire became an idol. Then, then your heart is divided. You, you, your love is divided. You've become double-minded. and you, It's all down to pride. It's all down to you saying, I, I have to have what I want. So James says, you want to fix it? You want to fix the war within that messes up your life and produces chaos in churches and homes? You want to fix that? Humble yourself before the Lord. And here's the comfort. He will exalt you. When you humble yourself, you're not just going down. You're going down to wait. You're going down to say, Lord, I, I'm your servant. I, I don't deserve anything. Whatever you want to do with me, do it, Lord. But you're doing that with the, with the comfort and the promise of James. And he will exalt you. Those who honor me, says the Lord, I will honor. And, and the Lord says... He is, a, he is the father of lights and loves to give good gifts to his children. He says that we're not to worry because you, you see how your, your heavenly father clothes the lilies of the field and, the birds of the, and feeds the birds of the air. And will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith, says Jesus. We're not to worry about 
what we shall eat or what we shall drink or what we shall wear. We're not to fix our minds on those things. The, the pagans run after those things. But it's not to be like that amongst us. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Father, we pray that you would help us to do so, that you'd help us to win this war within, that you'd forgive us as um, adulterous people for fixing our minds on the things of this world, whatever it may be for us. Lord, help us to repent, help us to cleanse our hands, help us, Lord, to purify our hearts. We pray that we wouldn't be double-minded. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us by the power of the Holy Spirit um, to submit ourselves, to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to you and to resist the devil. And Lord, we pray that you would enable us to win this war within and to know the joy and the blessing of having you strengthening us and drawing near to us. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.